It's good to see you this morning. Received a email from Ludmilla, who takes care of the diabetics money and dispensing of it in Ukraine. And she said, we're broke. So if any of you at College Hill who've been so generous over the years would like to help us with the diabetes ministry in Ukraine, uh, we'll be uh, sending those funds as soon as we have collected some to do so. So if you're interested, well, we'd appreciate your help along those lines. Doing study and research on our topic today, I read a story between two ministers. One was extremely, extremely discouraged. The other one was trying to get him to see that what he was doing was important. The one minister said, uh, I just despise being considered irrelevant. And the man trying to encourage him said, wait a second, wait a second. The gospel of Jesus, the message of, of, of the cross is never, never irrelevant. The second man thought for a moment and he says, okay, let me put it this way. I despise feeling like what I'm trying to do and the response of the people around me makes it irrelevant. And the first man said, that's your issue. Your issue is you're not understanding that the message that you have is, is the message that will make the difference in people's lives. And whether or not they accept it, whether or not they do it, that's not your job. Your job is to get them to see the relevance of the message of the gospel. Life. I kind of feel that way sometimes when I preach on a subject like salt and light, which we have for the last several weeks. Because sometimes I look at us and I see us walking out the door and we say, oh yeah, man, that was a great sermon. I'm going to be more salt. And then on Monday morning, the salt shaker is still upright. Tuesday morning, we still have the bushel basket over the light. We're just not trying to make that message work in our lives. So I, thinking about this this week, I thought, okay, how do we use salt and light in the real world? How can you and I become more what Jesus is describing here in Matthew chapter 5 in such a way that we're going to impact the world in which we live? We're going to make a difference. We're not going to be just a message that is irrelevantly accepted, but a message which becomes vital, very relevant in the lives of the people around us as well as in our own life. And so I hope that some of the things we share with you today will encourage you and strengthen you and cause you to say, okay, I understand. That's what it means for me to be salt and light in this world, the real world in which we live. When we talked about salt a couple of weeks ago, we suggested to you that salt in the shaker doesn't do any good. If you and I have the message of the gospel within us, but yet we never project it, we never empty out the salt shaker, it's not going to do much as far as this world around us is concerned. But if the salt is shaken out, it has every potential for good. So if we shake out that salt, we become the influence in the corner of the world in which we live. We're going to make a difference. And at the same time, we look at the light, and the light under the basket doesn't really fulfill its purpose. I'm reminded of the story of, of the trial that was being held 
concerning a railroad and an accident that had been very tragic. And the man, this was back in the days before we had electricity, et cetera, and the man who was, was the crossing guard at that particular intersection was put on the stand and, and he was asked the question, he says, were you there at your appointed task, your appointed duty at the time? Oh, yes, sir, I was. Did, did you have the lantern with you? Oh, yes, I had the lantern with me. Were, were you swaying the lantern so people could see that, that there was danger, that the train was coming so that they would stop? And he says, oh, yes, I, 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 I swayed the lantern very liberally. That was all the questions that was asked. But one of the railroad superintendents came up to him and said, Sam, he said, Sam, I noticed that there was a little quivering when he got to that last question. He says, you begin to wait, well, what was wrong? He said, I was afraid he was going to ask me, did you light the lantern? The superintendent said, did you light the lantern? He said, no. He was at the appointed place that he was supposed to be. He was waving the lantern like he was supposed to. He just failed to do one thing. He had failed to light that lantern. And when we have the message of Christ within us and we're not spreading it to those who are around us, we're not allowing the light to do its purpose here in this world. Several years ago, Sue and I were invited to go to a Garth Brooks concert in the old Texas stadium. And they handed us a cigarette lighter as we walked in. I wondered what in the world was that? You understand, I don't know about such things very much, but one time they turned off all the lights and they said, everyone, you know, now flick your, your lighter. And I was amazed at how bright the light was with 60,000 people just lighting a little old lighter. I was amazed. But I think in this world of darkness in which we live, in which so many people are, are, are needing something to believe in and something that will relevantly change their life, why it is that we don't see that our little candle can make the difference and can cause them to become different than what they are and cause us to bring about change in the world in which we live. So Jesus' idea in that text was that salt should be the influence and light should illumine. And if you and I are being called the salt of the earth and the light of the world, then we are to influence and we to illumine those that we come in contact with. That gets us to the text that Albert read for us a few moments ago. From Romans chapter 12, verse 14 through verse 21. Jesus makes salt and light relevant. It's one of those passages that we might describe, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where the real world is. This is the way in which we make that influence and we make that illumination accomplish the task that God wants it to accomplish. The realization that we need to come to is that salt having influence and light illuminating is a combination of the way we act and the way we think. Probably we ought to talk about the way we think first, but we're going to talk about the way we think second. Because the way we think is going to have everything to do with the way we act. Our actions come forth from within us. Have you ever said something that you stopped and said, hey, wait a second, where did that come from? That, 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 that's very uncharacteristic of me. Only to realize that maybe that's the way you've been thinking and therefore it came out. So as we go through this text, I want you to stop and think about how it causes us to be an a influence in this world for God, a, an illumination of the goodness of God, and see if we can in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis begin to take up some of the slack in this world 
and make a difference in this world in which we live. Ironically, where we're beginning in our text, it's not the beginning of the thoughts, but where we're beginning in our text, there is the response to the antagonist. The response to the antagonist. Anyone ever get under your skin? Anyone ever make you so mad you want to bop them? Oh, I'm sure that hasn't happened to y'all. Happens to me all the time. People say something, people do something. Maybe people bully you. That's become a real big watch word, and, and rightly so. Bullying's always been a problem. I was bullied when I was a kid. And even though I was bigger than some of them tried to bully back, they bullied me more. How do you respond? How, how do you respond to the antagonist that's, that, that's always trying to, to stir you up and make you mad and, and cause you problems? It might be a fellow employee. It, it might be a student that sits next to you. It might be the person who's next in the locker to yours. They're always opening their door in such a way you can't get in and get your books. It may be that person that, that wants to steal your boyfriend or your girlfriend. It may be that person who, who, who waits on you in the store but with such a, a calloused attitude that, that you wonder why in the world you went in there in the first place. How do you respond to the antagonist? Romans chapter 12 and verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Ooh, those are tough words. Because when I'm driving down the road and someone cuts me off, I, I hope they get a ticket. Of course, the policeman is never there, right? Until you cut someone off. Then you discover he's right around the corner. Yeah. Bless those who persecute you. I was in the store several months ago, and as Sue and I were standing there, a guy that was in line in front of us was just a little bit harsh and critical and judgmental and was giving the cashier quite a, quite a difficult time. When he left, bless that person's heart. She said, have a very good day, sir, and smiled at him. And I thought, how in the world could you do that? You might remember the story of the man who was standing there at the airline counter and, and things weren't going the way he wanted it. And he was giving the ticket agent all sorts of blues. And, and she just smiled and smiled and smiled and and finally she got him satisfied and he puffed off and left and the man came up and said, lady, I don't understand how in the world you could treat him with such dignity and respect. She says, you've got to understand, sir. He's on his way to London. His luggage is on its way to Hong Kong. <laughs> but that's not the approach. That's not blessing those who persecute you. That's not looking at people the way you ought to look at them. How did Jesus approach it? Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that they may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. You see, we've got to realize that our response to folks as salt and light is we're not doing it because of us, we're doing it because of whom we serve. We're not doing it because we don't deserve the bad treatment, but because they need to be influenced, they need to be illuminated so that they can become what Jesus wants them to be. Well, what about responsiveness to the blessed and responsiveness to those who are suffering? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Do you ever find that difficult? 
I do. All the time. People will come in and start bragging about, well, we just bought our brand new 2015 Lexus. I didn't know they were out. They really aren't, I don't think. I said, well, what was wrong with your 2012? Nothing, I just like the smell of a new car. Ooh, that becomes problematic, doesn't it? I don't know what's happened, but that's serious. That's why I always lay down a ready recollection. <laughs> you know? Someone comes in and you really wanted a new suit. There we go. You really wanted a new suit. And they've got a brand new. Is Hart Shafter and Mark still in business? I don't know. I haven't seen one of those in a long time. Or the latest style in dressing. Are you able to really rejoice with those who rejoice? But that's what he tells us. He says you rejoice with those who rejoice. And sometimes because of the way we feel about people and look at people, we see them weeping and what's our attitude? Do we weep with those who weep or do we say, I'm glad they finally got some torment. I'm glad they've got a problem. I'm glad there's some difficulty there. No, he says rejoice with those who rejoice. Even though you don't feel like you're being blessed, you weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. You see, for Saul to work and for light to work in this world, we can't be haughty. We can't be snobbish. We can't look down our noses at one another. Oh, that's hard because we, we stroke our own egos. We want our egos to make us feel like that we're really good, we're really better. It's kind of like the two preachers that I heard that were talking about, and they were talking about a third preacher and says, well, what sort of preacher is he? Is he as good as I am? And the other one said, well, no. No, he's better. You know, we have the same mind toward one another. If you're trying to be salt and light in this world, you're going to have to look at everything from a different perspective. Do not be haughty in mind, Paul says. But associate with the lowly. Look around you. There's people who are better off than you are. And you may be very well off. But there's people around you who are much less well off than you are. How do you respond to them? How do you treat them? Paul says, rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those that weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. In other words, he's saying, pride goeth before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Let the one who thinks that he stands take heed. Why? He may fall. You say, how in the world do I do this? How, 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 how do I rejoice with those who rejoice when I, I look and I see me not getting the things that they've got? And, and how do I weep with those who weep when I really feel no empathy for them? Uh, how can I be of the same mind toward all people? How do I do it? Well, it's a matter of perspective. You realize it's about God, not about you. It's about God working in your life, not about you. And that's the problem because every message that we receive subliminally and consciously in this world is trying to tell us it's all about you. It's all about the things you do, the things you have, the things that you are. And Paul is saying, no, to be salt and to be light in this world, it's not about you, it's about God. And your response to God. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now may the God who gives perseverance and encouragement grant you to be the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus. You see the emphasis upon the God, the Christ in the picture? 
Turning now to Philippians chapter two, make my joy complete, Paul says, by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. That goes against the grain of our world. That goes against the messages that you read in the magazines there in the grocery store line. That goes against everything that we're talked about and everything that we're told. And yet Paul says this is the way salt gets out of the shaker. This is the way the light gets from out from under the bushel. It's in our attitude toward those that we come in contact with and the respect that we learn to develop for all people, all individuals. So Paul says, be united, maintain the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Well, it's a pretty evil world out there, isn't it? Very evil world. How do we respond to the evil forces that are around us? I know I want to be salt, I want to be light, but, but how do I respond to all that evil? Paul says, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. I look at, at, at what's going on in our world today in religious circles and, and we find that, that we have a tremendous obstacle in Islam. How do you respond? It's very possible to not like the doctrine, to, to despise the false teaching, but still have a good attitude or a right attitude concerning the person who's espoused it. Maybe by you showing them the salt and the light, you can make the difference. You can convert them. It has happened. It is happening in the hearts and lives of people. What about that person who, who looks so very mean and evil that you come upon when the parking lot's not well lighted. They may be very dangerous toward you. But what sort of attitude of heart should you have for them? Here, here's someone that needs redeeming. Here's someone who needs to be changed into the likeness of Christ. Never pay back evil for evil. Respect what is right. You see, the bottom line is, as much as it lies within you, you have the ability to be at peace with all men. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 15, Paul says the same thing. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. That's the type of response that we have to the evil forces that are around us. Well, what about as salt and light our response to the human condition? Here's someone who has offended you, said all manner of evil about you. How, how do you respond? I think I learned a lot about this verse from my father. My father was a preacher as you well know, most of you know. He, he was a righteous man. In fact, he was among the most righteous men I've ever known. And he held very, very tenaciously to the teachings of the New Testament and he did his very best to interpret them fairly and honestly. And that didn't set well. Oh, he had very few problems with people out in the world. They loved Brother Bob. He had problems with the church. 
More than once when I was growing up, I would come upon a conversation that a young man should not hear two people having concerning his father. And I remember one time that there was a, a, a fellow who was deriding my father quite, quite seriously and calling him some pretty ugly and evil things. And I remember Gene Tarrant going into my father's office. I was standing right outside the door and he says, Bob, well, what do we do about the people who are saying these evil and ugly and mean things? And Daddy said, nothing. Gene says, but you, you need to make a response. Daddy said, no. My Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. He doesn't say, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says me. I believe my dad won the victory because he practiced this. When it would be hard, very hard for me to practice this. Don't take your own revenge. Leave room for the wrath of God. Let God, God have his place. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So you look at your enemy. And he's in need. And what do you do? You feed him. If he's thirsty, you give him drink. You see, what you're doing is you're letting the salt and the light work in your life so that it makes a difference in their life. See, this is Jesus' intent. This is what Jesus is trying to accomplish. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. That's hard to do, isn't it? That's hard to do. I've been fighting this battle all my life. But yet when I've been successful in doing it, number one, I felt better about myself because I knew that I was trying to do what Jesus wanted me to do, but it's always been amazing the results of what happens. Salt shaken out has every potential for good. That's the point that you and I need to grab a hold of and hold within our hearts and within our minds. Jesus' ideal, salt, influencing, light, illuminating. Paul ceases the writing of this passage with these words. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's how Jesus' ideal is realized in our lives. Don't let evil overcome you. You overcome evil evil with good. And that's the way we make the salt influence and that's the way we make the, the light illumine. Now I can't give you every single solitary illustration of how that happens on a day-to-day -day basis in your life, but hopefully you'll be able to, to connect the dots and figure out those situations in life where Paul has talked here on, on a very realistic basis how I can be salt and how I can be light in a very, very antagonistic world. The sermon is yours. The lesson is yours. The invitation comes. And it says, are you salt and are you light today? Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but you just haven't let Jesus work within you in your relationship with the people around you. Can we encourage you this morning? Maybe you need to ask for the prayers of the church. Maybe it, it, it's just prayers for strength. We want to give you an opportunity to have that prayer offered for you. Maybe you've been so belligerent that you realize, hey, I'm, I'm not salt, I'm not light for the Lord, and, and you need to respond. And ask not only God's forgiveness, but maybe ask your brothers and sisters because you haven't been salt and light, and that's influenced the way people feel about the church about the blood-bought bride of Christ. Maybe this morning you can't be salt and you can't be light because you haven't become His. You have not been immersed into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. 
You have not been raised to walk in newness of life. The baptistry is ready. We're ready to take your confession. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you're willing to turn from sin and turn toward God, trying to be that salt and that light, we'll take your confession and immerse you into Jesus and raise you to walk in newness of life. This morning, if you need to come to Christ, would you come to Christ while we stand and sing a song to encourage you?